Okay, so we only got through the first part of the chapter last week, so we'll pick up where we left off was uh, verse number 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse number 20. It says, Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. So the Bible says here, look, don't be children in understanding. Now, is there anything wrong with being a child? Anything wrong with being a child? No, obviously not. I mean, don't we all start off life as children? Absolutely, we start off life as a child physically. But here's the thing, although we start off life as a child physically, it's natural to desire to grow. It's natural to desire to grow. And the same applies when it comes to spiritual things. When it comes to spiritual things, we should desire to grow. It says in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You know, in the same way that a physical baby needs nutrition, it needs nourishment in order to grow. You know, because what happens if you do, don't give a baby milk? Is it going to grow? No, obviously not. Well, it's the same thing. As spiritual babes, we need to desire the spiritual milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It's interesting, the modern translations, they change it and just say, just desire pure spiritual milk. It doesn't say what it actually is. Whereas the King James Bible points out that it's the sincere milk of the word. That's what the believer needs in order to grow. Now, having said that, although we should desire to grow, there are some things that we should actually remain childlike in. There are things that we should remain childlike in. What does it say in verse number 20? In verse number 20 it says, How be it, in malice be ye children. In malice be ye children. And when it talks about malice, malice is talking about evil intent. You know, wanting to inflict harm or suffering upon others. When it comes to malice, when, when it comes to evil and, and wrong things, we should actually, you know, in that, we should be children. In other words, we shouldn't want to know all about that. Look, if you were at Romans chapter number 16. Romans chapter number 16 and verse number 19. Actually, actually you turn to um, Proverbs uh, 27, 27. I'll turn to... Uh, Romans chapter number 16. Look at Proverbs chapter number 27 and verse number 11. Proverbs chapter number 27 and verse number 11. It says in Romans 16, 19, it says, I would have you wise unto that which is good, but simple concerning evil. Wise unto that which is good. So there are things that God wants us to be wise about, to know a lot about, but there are things that he wants us to be simple about that he wants us to not necessarily know about. And that's exactly what he's saying here. And malice. Be ye children, but understanding, be ye men. You're there in Proverbs chapter number 27. Proverbs chapter number 27 and verse number, verse number 11 says, My son, be wise. My son, be wise and make my heart glad, that I may answer him that reproacheth me. Verse 12. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple passed on and are punished. So having said that, we should be simple, concerning evil, but we still do need to actually foresee evil. In other words, don't be blind to evil. Don't pretend that evil doesn't exist. Because look, let's be honest, isn't there, isn't there evil around us in the world today? Isn't evil, you know, you don't have to open your eyes and look very far. But here's the thing. According to the Bible, we don't need to do, dig too deeply in it. I mean, think about things like the occult. Is the occult evil? You know, absolutely it is. But therefore, some people can get themselves in trouble because they go in and they study. And they go deeply in to find out about stuff that's it's really just going to cause them more harm than good. It's a dangerous thing. I mean, look at what goes on in schools. Look at what goes on in schools today. People go, go to school, and what do they learn at school? At school, kids get taught about drugs. Kids, God isn't kids, true. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. They say that as well. And the, but they also they teach, them about, they teach them about drugs, stuff that kids have no business learning about. You know, don't they have, they have, um, they, they have sex education at schools? You know, and... Here's the thing. You can look at it from a, just a, a purely impartial point of view. Look, did it do any good? You know, I was just, I was just reading earlier early today that when you looked in the, in the United States, for example, the rate of STDs was steadily declining and declining and declining until they introduced sex education in schools. And then what happened to STDs? STDs then went up. STDs then climbed. And so here's the thing. They're, they're teaching, and obviously they're not even teaching it from you know, the, the, the right perspective. Yeah, you because know, I'm not saying when to say to to teach about sex education, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with sex itself. I mean the Bible actually says marriage is honourable in, in all and the bed undefiled and it says but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. There's nothing wrong with the marriage bed. There's nothing there's 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 nothing you know there's, there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with learning 
things that are good. Yeah. But there is something wrong with learning things that are evil. I mean, think about the things that they promote in schools. I mean, not only do they teach sex, sex education, they, they promote, well, maybe you're a, if you're a guy, maybe you should be a girl. Or if you're a, you know, if you're a girl, maybe you should be a boy. You know? it's not that they promote these wicked things. They promote perversion. But according to the Bible, we should stay simple concerning evil. We should stay simple concerning evil. But having said that, we should still grow in our understanding. Grow in our understanding. Well, here's the thing. How are we going to grow in our understanding? How are we going to grow in our understanding? Look if you're at Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse number 130. Psalm 119 and verse number 130. Psalm 119 and verse number 30 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. So if we were to follow Paul's admonition here, to be um, in malice, be children, but in understanding, be men, to grow up, not be a child, but to be a man in our understanding, we need to be in the word. We need to be in, we need to be in, in God's word. We need to be reading God's word every day. Read God's word every day. Listen, listen to God's word every day. You know, there are, there, there are, there are places where you can, you can listen today. I mean, today we have so many advantages, advantages that people have never had historically. You know, historically, God's people sometimes, they haven't, they haven't had a Bible. They haven't had a Bible. Now, many of us, we've got more than one Bible. We've got multiple Bibles. But, but, but here's the thing. There were a time when God's people, they had one Bible between a whole congregation. They maybe had, they maybe had part of a Bible. Okay, And so here's the, the thing. We need to take advantage of what we've been given. Now, one of the things we've been given today, much, so many of us today, we, we have a cell phone. We, 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 have, we have, just quite please, it's preaching. Yeah, you can chat after this. <coughs> so here's, so he, here's the thing. Touch off and upward. Yeah. Oh, oh. Oh, take a bit of that and go. Yeah, God bless. Um, so here's the thing. Not reading the Bible, re, 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 reading, reading the Bible is what we need in order to help us grow. Turn if you would back to First Corinthians chapter number 14. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse number 21. First Corinthians 14 and verse number 21. It says, In the law it is written. So having just said, look, we need an understanding to be men, he now follows up and says, in the law, it is written. Think about Jesus. Remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? When Jesus was tempted by the devil, what did he respond with? It is written. It is written. Remember the devil came and tempted him. Three different, three different temptations, and each time Jesus responded with it is written. Jesus was someone who, has, in his understanding, he was a man. He knew God's word. But here's the thing. When we look at verse number 21, it says, In the law it is written. Well, what, what's it written? With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. You see, it says in Isaiah 28 verse 11, it says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. With stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Later on in Isaiah 30 verse number 8, it says, Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people. Lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. And what he says is that he's going to speak to these people and they're not going to hear. They're going to refuse to hear. Look at verse number 22. Verse number 22, he says, Wherefore, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But, but prophesying serveth not for them which, that believe not, but for them which believe. So notice he said, tongues are a sign. Who are they a sign for? Tongues are a sign not for them that believe. So is it a tongues speaking in unknown tongues? Is that a, for believers? No, not for them that believe, but for them that believeth not. But prophesying serveth not for them which believe not, but for them which believe. So tongues were given as a sign for unbelievers. And we can see that. I mean, look, when you think of tongues, where's the, where's the time when you see tongues? Where do they show up? Where, the, where do tongues show up in the Bible? What do you still think of? Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost. Well, look at what happened in Acts chapter number 20, and Acts chapter number 2. In the day of Pentecost, it says in Acts chapter number 2, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. 
and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with what? Other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude... The multitude came together, that's all the people, and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia, Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So what do we see there? Tongues, when are they introduced? For these people that need to hear the gospel, because that's exactly what this is in the day of Pentecost. Peter and the other disciples, the other believers, were filled with the Holy Ghost, they spake with tongues, and they preached, and we see thousands, if we read the chapter, we see thousands of people get saved. You know, you could also turn to Acts chapter number 10. In Acts chapter number 10, we read about Cornelius. Cornelius and his friends and his family. And what happens? Peter goes once again and preaches to Cornelius. And what happens? Because Cornelius, remember Cornelius, he was a, he was a devout man. He was one who feared God with all his house. A lot of people go, oh, this, this person's obviously on his way to heaven. But we find out in chapter number 11, he says, look, he shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And at the end of chapter 10, we see Cornelius and the, those with him, they get saved. And what happens? They get saved and they speak with other tongues. Okay? And so you, you see the same thing in, in chapter number 19, in chapter number 19 of Acts, where, where Paul finds people who, um, it says certain disciples, and then they said they haven't even heard of the Holy Ghost. They said they were baptized unto John's baptism. These were people who didn't know the gospel. They hadn't even heard about the Holy Spirit. And once they heard about Jesus, then what happened? They spoke with tongues. Okay, that was a, we, In each of these cases, we see that it's associated with people getting saved. You know, People who weren't saved, but it's associated with unbelievers, and that's exactly what we see here. But in contrast, most prophesying or preaching is for believers. And that's what it says in 1 Corinthians 14, that tongues were assigned for unbelievers, but preaching, prophesying, is for believers. And understand, this is obviously not talking about all preaching. I mean, obviously, unbelievers, what? They need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the gospel. You know, when we think about Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Okay, so we're not, but obviously, unbelievers, they need to hear the gospel preached. But here's the thing. Is the general target of preaching in church believers or is it unbelievers? Is it believers or unbelievers? It's obviously, it's believers. It's believers. Okay? So this whole idea of seeker-sensitive services, this is something you, you hear about a lot today. Seeker-sensitive services. It might sound like a good idea on the surface, but it's not what God says to do. It's not what God says to do. You see, because if you make church all about preaching the gospel, I mean, many people would think, look, an unbeliever wandered in, and so we should, I, I should just preach the gospel. Well, it's... it's, it's that's not what God has said it for. I mean, obviously, the reason he came was for food. You know, he wasn't coming to listen. He wasn't coming to hear. But the Bible says we're supposed to go and to reach them. You know, we're supposed to go and reach them. I mean, think what it says in, in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15 said, um, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I think that's what it says. I'm probably quoting the wrong gospel. Let's have a look. Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel. Oh, good, I got it right. To every creature. That's what he said to do. Go and preach the gospel. But a lot of people have this idea, no, we need to bring people into the church and preach the gospel to them in here. Well, that's not what he said. In fact, look, that was in Mark 16. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter number 28. In verse number 19, he said, go ye therefore. Did he stay? Wait. No, he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. And then what? baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, and lie with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Notice this. You've got to go. Go on and preach them the gospel. Then people obviously they believe, they get saved. Baptize them. After that, then what happens? Then you teach them all things whatsoever he's commanded us. You know, we see the same thing back in Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. In verse number 1, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, in verse number 1, when Paul first came to Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 
2 and verse 1 says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, of wisdom, declare unto you the, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's preaching the gospel. That's what the unbelievers need. When Paul came to the unbelieving Corinthians, what did he do? He preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's when he came. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And the Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God under salvation to everyone that believeth. He says in verse 6, How about we speak wisdom among them that are perfect? You know the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So here's the thing. He says, he, when he came to them, it was just Jesus Christ and him crucified. But later on, after they got saved, then he went on and taught them more. He then taught them the wisdom of God. But we need to understand, look, that there's, there's a... The, the basic purpose of, you know, the, the preaching that goes on in church, that is for believers. That is for believers. Because look, here's the other thing. If you decide that, okay, what we can do at church, we're just going to preach the gospel. Yeah, bring, bring the lost in and we'll preach the gospel to them. Well then, are you guys going to go? Why go? I mean, because, you know, they're going to come in here. And, oh, here, the pastor will preach it to them. But no, the Bible says to each one of us, go ye therefore into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But here's the thing. There are churches that have got this round the other way. They've got this round the other way. Instead of thinking, oh, tongues, they're a specific sign at particular times for unbelievers. And preaching is primarily for believers. Obviously, you've got preaching gospel lost, but the general preaching of the word of God, that's, you know, in the congregation of the saints. But they have the opposite. You come to church, and what do you hear? It's all about tongues. Isn't that what you hear? Look at um, verse, number, verse number 23. Verse number 23, he says, look, if therefore the whole church be come together in one place and all speak with tongues. Imagine if we all came together at church and everyone's blah, 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 blah. <laughs> everyone's speaking in imagine that, everyone's speaking in tongues and you know, I, I could impersonate some tongues speaking I've heard, but I won't do that. He no. says, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? <laughs> Wouldn't people these guys are crazy. They're nutters. They're absolutely nutters. They would. Okay? And because why? Because it is crazy. It is crazy. As we get through the rest of the chapter, we'll see how crazy and unbiblical it actually is. Look at verse number 24. It says, But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. You see, good preaching can still convince people. Because if we kept reading in Romans chapter 10, verse after verse 30, I think we stopped about verse 15, and it says in verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Okay? And so, the, the point is though, when someone just wanders into a church, that's not the normal situation. It says if someone chances to come in. Normal, church is supposed to, it's a gathering of believers. The purpose of it is not preaching the gospel to the lost. That's not what it is. But if it does happen, look, verse 25, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. So falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. You see, you can get supernatural preaching as well. That can happen, you know? And that's in the sense that God can give exactly the words that someone needs to hear. And that does still happen. Well, that happens just in general within church. I don't know how many times I've heard people talk to me after service and say, well, you know, this really hit me, this point here. And it's like, where was that? that boy wasn't in the sermon. I didn't write it down. I didn't think he even said it. But they, they heard. Yeah, yeah. You know, God can use things that are not on my mind, not on my heart at all. No, I pray before and ask God, give me the words to speak. But here's the thing. God can do a work and he can, he can, he can do stuff that's going to show people. It's going to reveal what is in their heart. Look at verse number 26. How is it then, Britain? When you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, had the doctrine, had the tongue, had the revelation, had the interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Now this verse here, this verse is not a description of what should happen in the church. It's not. And a lot of people think it is. Say, when you come together, this is what's supposed to happen. This is, now this is what they were doing. He says, look, how is it then, brethren? When you come together, every one of you has got a psalm, got a doctrine, a tongue, a revelation, interpretation. 
But the way they're doing it is not the way it's supposed to be done. What they think is, look, everyone's got something to share. I'm gonna, you know, I've got this doctrine I'm going to bring. I've got the psalm. I've got this revelation. I've got this interpretation. I've got something to share. But look, it's not supposed to be about you. It's not supposed to be about you. It's supposed to be about what? The church. It's supposed to be about edifying the church. That's what's supposed to happen. Everything is supposed to be done unto edifying. That's why Paul made it clear earlier in the chapter. You know, why is it, when someone prophesies, what do they do? They edify the church. They build up the church. When someone's speaking in a tongue, what's it doing? That's just, if, not, if there's no interpretation, then all they're doing is edifying themselves. It's supposed to be about the other believers, not about you. You see, when people have a lot to say, it's often all about them. It's all about them. And so people go, oh, I've got this bit to share. I want to share this. I want to share this. And hey, there can be times when people share stuff. But that's not the purpose. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to edify and to build up. Because look, if everybody shares, in fact, well, well, we'll get on to it in a minute. Look at verse number 27. He says, look, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Now here's the thing, in the previous verse said, look, everyone's got a psalm, everyone's got a doctrine, everyone's got a tongue, everyone's got a revelation, everyone's got an interpretation. So that shows that doesn't line up with here, because here he's saying two, or at the most three, two or three, and let one interpret, and that's it. So if two or three, then you could say one interpret, so maybe one for each of those two or three. That means you've got two or three, and so it's not everyone. It's clearly, it's not everyone that's interpreting. Only two or three can speak, providing there is an interpreter. And yeah. why? Because the purpose is to edify the church. It's not for you to get stuff off your chest or for you to feel good or you to you know, have your share session. <laughs> That's what it's about. Look at verse number 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. If there is no interpreter, then they must keep quiet. And we've seen that earlier on already in the chapter. I mean, back in um, verse number 23, it says, look, if the whole church come together in one place and all speak with tongues... They come of those, look, they'll think you're crazy. I mean, what did it say back in verse number two? For he that speaketh an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how to speak of his spirit, spirit, he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men, to edification, and exhortation, and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So what does that mean? If there's no interpreter, be quiet. If there is no interpreter, be quiet. Look at verse number 29. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. Let the other judge. So here's the thing. It's the same with preaching. So tongues are limited, you know, two or three, only if there's interpretation. But it's the same with prophets. Two or three can speak, and it should be judged. Two. Or, so it's not everyone, only two or three, and it should be done, judged. So what this means, look, don't just accept whatever preaching you hear. Just because you, you hear a preach. I mean, look what Paul says back in chapter number 10. Chapter number 10 and verse number 15. He says, look, I speak unto wise men. Remember, if he wants them to be wise, not children. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. Paul's saying, look, judge what I'm saying. Say, is what he's saying right or is it wrong? Well, how do you know if it's right or wrong? Does it line up with the Bible? Does it line up with the Bible? Look at Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter number 17 and verse number 10. Acts chapter number 17 and verse number 10. Acts 17 and verse number 10, it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed. Also of honourable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. So what do we see here? We see, look, the Bereans, they were noble. Why? Because they searched the scriptures daily with those things and so. They heard the Apostle Paul preaching, and they said, well, is this true or not? Let's have a look in the Bible. Let's search the scriptures to see if what he's saying is true. Look at um, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 5, and verse number 20. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, and verse number 20. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 says, despise not prophesying. So understand, we need to have a balance here. We should judge the preaching, but don't just say, oh, well, I just, just all preaching's bad. You know, don't know. Look, he says, look, despise not prophesying, but then follows it up with prove all things. 
hold fast that was good, that which is good. So he's saying, look, don't despise pro- preaching, don't despise prophesying. It says, hold, prove all things. That means, you know, test them, and then hold fast that which is good. Because guess what? Some prophesying, some preaching is not good. <laughs> There's plenty of bad preaching, preaching false doctrine, preaching heresy. So he says, look, don't despise it, but verify it. You know, check to see if it's legitimate, it's what's being preached. Look back at um, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse number 30. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse number 30. It says, If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. So notice, it's okay to have input from others during preaching. It's okay to have input from others. But does that mean, it's, is it just a free-for-all that anyone can say what they want? Or was that helpful before with Faiti saying stuff? You know, some guy wandering off the street. No, that's not, that's not helpful. That's not useful. And we understand. Would it be helpful if, you know, if children were, you know, making noise and speaking? And No, that's not helpful. And obviously, we understand, you know, children have to learn and children have to grow and, and so forth and be taught. But we need to realise, look, it, it is okay for people, it's okay for there to be input. It says, look, if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. You know, so, so if something just suddenly comes on Doug's heart and he's, he has a point, it's like, hey, this, that, that's absolutely fine for that to happen. That's perfectly legitimate. Because the aim is to edify the church. You know, I mean, we can all learn from each other. We can all learn from each other. I mean, I'm looking forward to hearing Doug preach on Sunday. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's always good to know that he's studying out a message he's going to bring. It's like, what is God going to use Doug to feed us with on Sunday? That's great. That's a, that's a real blessing. Look at verse number 31. Verse number 31. It says, For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and that all may be comforted. Now, here's the thing. Does this mean that everyone can preach in church? Is this what this is saying? You know, because a few people say, all means all. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> You've got to take it within the context of what it is. Hmm. You know, when it says, you know, when it talks about, remember, all Jerusalem and Judea went out to hear John the Baptist preach. So you think Caiaphas and all those guys, they were all out there? Do you think they all went out there? No. Okay, so you've got to take it in the context. So when it's saying you may all prophesy, that's within the context of there are certain people, and we're going to find out in a minute, that's specifically forbidden. I mean, look, here's the thing. Do you think women, just at a guess, you know, and when we did read the chapter before, we haven't got to the verses yet, do you think women are supposed to be preaching in church? What about children? Do you think you know, children are supposed to be up here preaching in church? Maybe, maybe new believers. You know, someone, someone just got saved last week. Oh, yeah, that's great. Come on in. Why don't you come up and teach us the Bible? You know, because bearing in mind what as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, not as newborn babes get up and, and tell people all the wisdom that you've got. No, here's the thing. A man who has been saved for a while should have a desire to contribute. He should have a desire to contribute, to teach, to comfort others. That's what it says. You know, you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and that all may be comforted. Look at verse number 32. Verse 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches the saints. You see, it is a controlled thing. It's not a, it's not a free-for-all. Just because something's on your heart, you it's not that you can, I can't hold it in. You know, you, you have control. You know, I mean, look, when you, when you see confusion reigning in a church, that's not from God. God is not the author of confusion. And look, we talked about it before, think about all these people standing there babbling. In tongues. Confusing. A lot. Very confusing. Look at verse number 34. Let your woman keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now, look. This is a controversial subject in some churches. This is a controversial subject in some churches. Probably most churches. Yeah, most churches. You're right. Yeah, probably most churches. This is something that has the potential to offend unbelievers. If an unbeliever hears this, look, well, we need to keep silent at church. But look, many believers will get offended by this as well. There are many believers that would read this and think, oh, look, Paul, he's just some chauvinist. But it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. Let your woman keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto him to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now look, is this saying that women must keep silent when they walk through the door of a church building? You know, have you been, you know, when you walked in, when you said hello to people, you know, are you in trouble, Heidi? You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. Is that what it's saying? What have we been talking about? We've been talking about prophesying or preaching. 
speaking in tongues, you know, with interpretation, not without interpretation. So when someone is leading, when someone is teaching in a church, church, that person, hello, they need to be a man. They need to be a man. In case you wondered, have a look at 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. This is not some difficult to understand subject. 1 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 12. 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 12 says, But I suffer, and that word suffer means allow. But I suffer not. That means allow not. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp what authority over the man, but to be in silence. What do we see in 1 Corinthians 14? Let your woman keep silence in the churches. But to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So he's saying, look, women need to be silent. They shouldn't usurp authority over men because Adam was first formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived. The Bible says Adam was not deceived by Satan. Who was deceived by Satan? Eve was. Now, Adam sinned, but he did it willingly. He knew what he was doing. But Eve was fooled by Satan. And that's, that's, that's the pattern. People say, oh, well, it's just a cultural thing in Paul's day. But he's gone back to Adam and Eve. That's right back. The first man, the first woman. He's going right back there. Look, if you continue on in the next chapter, it says, look, this is, as we're talking about who's speaking, who's got the authority within the church. It says, this is a true saying. In other words, in case you wondered, you know, it's like how Jesus often says, truly, truly. Now, he didn't need to say that, because whatever Jesus says is true, but just says, look, truly, truly. Well, he says, look, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of bishop, he desireth the good work. A bishop then must be blameless. What's the first thing on the list? The husband of one wife. So that's automatically ruled out all women from being a bishop, because they can't be the husband of one wife. They can't be. Okay? I mean, you go and look at Romans, what it talks about women and women and men and men. Calls it vile affections. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behaviour, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection to all gravity. So he's got to be married and have children, and the children, he needs to be in charge of not they, sh- they, they can't be running wild. He says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And then it says, not a novice. Remember we talked about women are not supposed to be speaking, children are not. I guess new believers, not a novice. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding mystery of the faith and a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved, tested, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless, even so must their wives. Be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful, all things. So once again, the deacons must have wives. They must be married. They must be a man. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling the children and their own house as well. So it's not just ruling the children. It's ruling the whole house. For they that have used the office of deacon well, perch themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write unto thee, hoping to come to thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So these instructions would say, this is what's supposed to go on at church. That's what it is. But outside of church, are women allowed to teach and preach outside of church? Yes, they are. They are outside of the context of church. Okay, and In fact, that's why this is what it's describing here, and it's the same thing in 1 Corinthians 14. But we'll see in a wee second here, look at... Um, uh, Mm, yeah, look at Titus. Look at Titus, chapter number... Oh, where are we here? Oh, actually, no, we'll, come, we'll go back to that later on. Don't need to turn there, but Revelation chapter number 2 and verse 20, Paul emphasises this again. He says, look, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee to the church of Thyatira, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach, and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. And to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So notice, this woman is teaching, and she's teaching wrong things. She's leading people down the wrong path because of what she's teaching. 
And she said, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into her bed, and them that commit adultery with her into a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. You see, having a woman teaching in the church, it leads to great error. It leads to great error. I mean, you see churches that have women teachers and preachers. I mean, it's already a great error to start with, but they're heading further. Yeah. You know, look at the, the, the denominations that have said, yes, we can have women in leadership. Look at the, you know, who's done it for ages? United Methodists, haven't, haven't they done it for ages? Yep. And of course, what do they have now? Now they've got homosexual, yep. homosexual, lesbian leadership in the church. That's what they've got, because once you let go, look, the Bible says that authority is supposed to be for man. That's what he said back in Timothy. He said, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to use authority over the man. Authority belongs with the man. In the home, he's supposed to be ruling, the, the, you know, ruling well his own house. In the church, in the country, in the country, the authority belongs to a man. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 12 says, As my people, children of their oppressors, and women rule over them. Women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Sadly, we've got a woman in leadership in this country, and she's leading us down a slippery slope really, really fast. She wants to make us like the Soviet Union. That's what, that's what, that's what she wants. She's a communist, you know? Anyway, stop, or we'll, we'll get in trouble. Get back to 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14. We want to keep it short tonight. 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 35. So look, it says, look, let your woman keep silence in the churches. It's not permitted them to speak. They're commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. You see, women should be learning from their own husbands. You know, or maybe in, you know, if they're younger, maybe from their fathers, if, if that's possible. Okay? Now, here's the thing. That's the, that's the best situation. But look, if you haven't got a husband to go home and ask, or if you don't have a father, you've got to go home and ask. But this is saying, what, the point of this is to say, women shouldn't be a part of joining in. Because and, and, you know, remember, it's okay to ask questions within the church, but only if you're a man asking questions during the service. Because look, when you ask a question, yeah. it can be a way of leading the teaching in a certain direction. Yeah. You know, you've thought of a point and you're asking a question because you're wanting to bring certain scriptures in. You, you know, it's not just uh, just a, a simple, you know, in many cases. And so here's the thing, look, husbands and fathers, they should know the Bible better than their wives and their children. They should know the Bible better. That means if your wife or your children know the Bible, you need to go and get reading and get learning. <laughs> he says, look, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. I mean, remember we saw in chapter number 11, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. But guess what? It's a shame for women to speak in church. Just as much as it would be a shame if I came up here and had long hair, guess what? It would be a shame for a woman to speak. And here's the thing. Don't they often go together? The same churches that will have long-haired men will also have women speaking. They will. And they'll have widespread tongue speaking as well. That'll be all go. They go like hand in glove. Look, could it be any clearer? Could it be any clearer? He says it four times in two verses. Look, let your woman keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they command to be under obedience as also the saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands where at home for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Keep silence, don't speak, learn at home, and it's a shame if they do speak at church. Pretty clear. Verse number 36. He says, What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? Did the word of God come from the Corinthians? Or did it go only to the Corinthians? No. We know with the Corinthians, they were doing lots of things wrong. And presumably, women were speaking publicly. Presumably, because otherwise, why is he warning about it? I suspect that's the case. There's over and over, he's correcting. These are things that are going wrong in that church. Now, here's the thing. Is there a time for a woman to be speaking? Is there a time for a woman to be preaching? Yes. There is. There's a time for a woman to preach. Keep your finger in 1 Corinthians and look in Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 1, Philippians 4 verse 1 says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved, I beseech Yodius and beseech Syntyche, 
that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which laboured with me in the gospel. What were they doing? Preaching the gospel. With Clement also, with other my fellow labourers whose names are in the book of life. Look at Acts chapter number 21. Acts chapter number 21 and verse number 8. Acts chapter number 21. Acts chapter number 21 and verse number 8. Acts 21 and verse number 8. It says, In the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. The same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Which did prophesy. You see, look, here's the thing. People will say, oh, but you know, you, you can't mean that women are supposed to be silent. The church goes, he's got, they prophesied. And these women, they preached. But here's the thing. Where did they do it? In the church? No. Let your woman keep silence in the churches. Is that difficult to understand? If he says, look, woman keeps silence in the churches, but then in other places he says, look, they, these were, you know, these were preaching, these were prophesying. Well, where do you think they did it? Outside. <laughs> Somewhere else. Yeah. You know, I know there's, there's a big world, there's plenty of places to speak, there's plenty of I mean, women can teach. Look at um, Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2 and verse number 3. Titus chapter number 2 and verse number 3. It says, The aged woman likewise, that they be in behaviours becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Notice that, teachers of good things, that they may teach. But I thought you said, Paul, didn't you say, I suffer not a woman to teach? Who wrote Titus? Oh, Paul did. But I suffer not a woman to teach, that they may teach the young woman to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, Paul is not schizophrenic. He's not saying, they teach, they don't teach, they teach, they don't teach. Listen, this is not that difficult to understand. But actually, this is another one of those unpopular passages, isn't it? Here's another one of those unpopular passages. So what does he say here? He says, look, the word, it didn't come from you. The Corinthians wasn't the source of the word of God, and it didn't just go to them. Some people have this idea as well, well, well that was just to Titus. You know, or the Thessalonians, that was just to Thessalonians. The Corinthians, but that was just a letter to the Corinthians. We can't apply that to us. We can't tell a woman to keep silence in the church. That was just something that Paul said to the Corinthians. Well, how about we look at the start? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the will of God and Sosthenes our brother, and to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all, that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So it's the Corinthians, and it's everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. It's the all believers, everyone who's saved. Is that you? Is that me? Guess what? Corinthians is to you. So it's not just applying to them, it's applying to <laughs> all of us. Sorry, lose that one. Back, verse, back chapter number 14, verse number 37. We're going quickly. Verse number 37. He says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. You know, just, just in case. <laughs> just in case we just happen to think that this was just Paul giving us his opinion. Well, I think this is just Paul giving his opinion. Sorry. <laughs> he didn't give any room. Because look, do you know there are people that teach exactly that? I'm pretty sure the biggest Baptist church in Dunedin teaches exactly that. That, that, was, just, that was just Paul. That was just for the time. What did Paul say? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. This is God's command. There's no room for doubt. There's plenty. There are doubtful disputations. There are doubtful things. There are things that there's debate about. But look, come on. This is, this is not one of them. This is not one of them. Verse 38. Verse 38. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. In spite of that, in spite of how clear it is, people will still choose to remain ignorant. They will choose deliberate blindness. You know what's the old saying go? You can lead a horse to water. You can't make him drink. That's exactly right. It's like, you know, it's like when you're preaching the gospel. You go and preach the gospel. He said, go ye and preach the, you know, preach the gospel to every creature. But can you make people believe? No more than you can get a horse and shove its head under water and make it. You can't. You can't do it. Our job is just to sow the seed. Our job is just to preach the truth. 
and let people believe what they want to believe. You know, the Bible does say, where the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. You're free to believe. Or not to believe. The unbeliever is free to believe or not to believe. You're free to believe, hey, look, this is what it says. And if you've got doubts, hey, look, come and chat to me afterwards, you know. Search the Scriptures. See. Let's finish up. Verse number 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So, in summary, look, we should all desire to prophesy. We should all desire to preach. We should not forbid speaking in different languages, provided it's done in a biblical manner. So, you know, someone can get up and speak in Chinese or Vietnamese or, you know, whatever language you want. Yeah, they can speak in other languages, provided there is an interpreter. Provided there's an interpreter. Everything's supposed to be done decently and in order. Because God is a God of order. You know, God, he's, not, he's not the author of confusion. Now, this is a bit of a, <coughs> excuse me, controversial chapter in 1 Corinthians. For some reason. But it doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be a controversial chapter. You know, it's true that, that many people will have a different interpretation of this chapter. But Peter tells us, look, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So what he's saying is, look, it's not that, oh, you've got your interpretation, oh, I've got mine. No. It's not of a private interpretation. God meant what he said and said what he meant. Now, some of it, we might under- misunderstand parts of it, yeah, for sure. But I mean, look, was this, this, wasn't really, this wasn't really too tricky. That wasn't too tricky to understand. Peter also says, look, there are things in Paul's epistles, and he's trying to get at them, he says there are things in Paul's epistles that are hard to understand. You know, and, and, and let's be honest, Paul was a bit more learned than Peter was. You know, Peter was a fisherman, whereas, you know, Paul was, was more learned. He'd studied. Although he thought his former training and stuff, he counted it done. But anyway, there were things in Paul's epistles hard to understand that unlearned and unstable people rest or twist like they do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. They twist them to their own destruction. Look, if you would, in, um, might be the last place we'll turn, Matthew chapter number 22. Matthew chapter number 22. Look at Matthew chapter 22 in verse number 23. You see, people do twist the scriptures because they have their own beliefs that they want to believe. Matthew 22 and verse number 23. It says, In the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. Now look, the Sadducees are coming to Jesus saying there's no resurrection. Look, does the Bible talk a bit about the resurrection? It does. The resurrection. In fact, Next week we're going to get in chapter 15. And it's all about the resurrection. But look, the Sadducees came to Jesus and they say, look, they say there's no resurrection. And they asked him a question. They say, Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. So they say, yeah, we've read this in the Bible. This is what's supposed to happen. Now there were with us seven brethren. And the first, when he'd married a wife, deceased. And having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered, said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures. You see, what's the problem? Not knowing the Scriptures. What did he start with? It is written. In malice be children, but understanding be men. He says, the problem with you is you don't know the Bible. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Because that's the thing with the, with, the, with the Sadducees. They didn't know the scriptures, and they didn't know the power of God. They didn't know the gospel. They weren't saved. And that's why they, oh, resurrection? No, we don't think there's any such thing. For look, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So in the resurrection, guess what? Marriage? No. How many Mormons would have benefited greatly if they'd read this before getting hoodwinked by Joseph Smith? Yep. Is, this, is this hard to understand? It's not. This is not difficult to understand. 
But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So look, people will twist the scriptures to say whatever they want. But it doesn't alter the plain meaning. It doesn't alter the plain meaning. When people don't know the scriptures, they go into all sorts of false doctrine. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And why do people lack knowledge? He says, look, because thou hast rejected knowledge. It's not that I, was just, I wasn't clever enough to understand. It's because, look, they rejected the knowledge is there, and they reject it. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast, what's the problem? Thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Pretty grim consequences. Why does it come about? People lack knowledge because they reject it, and they forget God's law. Turn to First Peter as we finish up. First Peter, because we end up seeing it. You see, the antidote to the confusion of the Corinthian church was to be in the Bible, to learn the Bible, to know the Bible. And the antidote to the confusion that's in churches today is to be in the Bible and to know the Bible, not be taken in by false teachers. It says in um, verse 24, All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is a flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word, and thank you that your word does endure forever. That your word is true from the beginning, that every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. We thank you that the entrance of thy word giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. Help us to not be simple, but to be wise. We can be simple concerning evil, simple concerning malice, but help us to be wise in understanding. Help us to be wise in your truth. Lord, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for giving us your word. I mean, how confusing would it be if we didn't have your word? We're so blessed in this day and age. Help us to take advantage of the many blessings and the benefits that you've given us. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.